Hello, and welcome to Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this, brother, sister, stranger, are you reigning in life? I say again, are you reigning in life? Now I'm not talking about trials and tribulations, for Jesus said we will all have trials and tribulations, and they persecuted Jesus. But they not also persecute us. I'm not talking about the fiery darts or the attacks of the evil one. I'm talking about overall being circumspect, taking a step back, and judging soberly. Are you reigning in life? We're told how to live by God. The instruction manual for life. God's teachings to us. The Bible. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. To Genesis. This is all the way back in Genesis. Chapter 1. Then God said. Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea. Over the birds of the air. And over the cattle over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given. Sure sounds. Like reigning. Like ruling. Like having dominion. Reigning in life. For we are made in the image of God. Does God not reign? Does he not rule? Now I don't want to get confused on this. We are called to be servants of God. And to serve God. And to serve our fellow man. But we are called to reign in life, reign over our environment. We are part of God's creation, and this may upset some of you, but we are a higher form of creation. Only about man did God say he made us in his very own image. I didn't realize this until I just went back, and who knows how many times I've read Genesis and read these verses. Until I went back and read this, right now, this hadn't popped out at me. This is before he ever makes man, before he created man. God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And it continues. Before he ever made man, he had a plan for us to reign and rule on the earth. To have dominion. To be in control of our environment. To reign in life. Before we were ever formed. And then when we were formed, he tells man... He tells woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Have dominion over. The very first thing he tells man. So I ask you again, are you reigning in life? And again, we all have trials and tribulations. And we all screw up from time to time. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But overall, are we reigning in life over the big stuff? Again, step back. Look at your life. Are you reigning over the big things? Over what's really important? Over fear? Over worry? Over anxiety? 
It talks about in hell the first groups mentioned are the fearful and the unbelieving. Are you reigning over fear? When it seems like the whole world over the last couple of years has spiraled down in fear, are you ruling over your fear? Are you reigning over that? Fear's little brothers, anxiety, worry. We're not told by Jesus not to worry. Does he not say, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will put on? Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. If God is number one in your life, if you are seeking God, if you are running hard after God, number one in your life, you seek him for protection and provision. I don't know how you could not be reigning in life. Again, the big things. Reigning over sin. Are you reigning over sin or is sin reigning over you? Are you ruling over it? Beating it into submission? Now, Satan is called the accuser and he tempts and he'll always come and try. But in the long war, are you winning the battle over sin by the grace of God? Remember how this started, reigning in life by the grace of God. Is that abundance of grace in your life, are you reigning over sin? We went back to Genesis. Let's go back again. Likely you're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. Well, this is before Cain kills his brother Abel, and God comes to him. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Before the first murder in the Bible, before Cain kills his brother Abel, God comes to intervene. He warns Cain. God says sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. It gives you this kind of visual picture of sin manifested as a beast lying in wait, in ambush. And what is his warning to Cain? You must rule over it. And the first thing God tells man, you are to have dominion. So, I say again, take a step back. Look circumspectly at your life. Look around, judge soberly as an honest man or woman. Are you reigning in life? Are you reigning over sin? Are you? If you look at your relationship with sin, have you beat it into submission? Are you ruling over it, dominating over your sin? Or is it the reverse? And does it have control over you? Does the Bible not say you are a slave to that which you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? Let's go back to the beginning of our reading today. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So I urge you to receive that grace, receive that forgiveness, bathe in it, be washed in it, be clean, so that you can reign in life. If you're saying to yourself, you know, I'm not worthy. I haven't done right. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve it. To that I would say, Amen, brother. Me neither. Thank God that He is rich in mercy. Thank God that we serve such a good God that we don't get what we deserve. We get far better than we deserve. It's not about you. It's about Him. It's not how bad you are. It's about how good God is. That's the good news. Say, Amen, brother. You don't deserve it. Let's read that again with eyes open. Receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Grace, by definition, unmerited, unearned favor. If you earned it, it would not be grace by definition. It doesn't tell you to earn it. It says receive grace. It's a gift. A gift by definition is not earned. If it's earned, then it's wages and it's not a gift. You get somebody a gift, it's because you love them. It's not because they earned it. You receive grace because God loves you, not because you earn it. 
In that same chapter, one of my favorite verses. For when we were yet without strength, or when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Not when we were trying really hard, when we were without strength. Christ died for who? The ungodly. Now again, Satan is called the tempter, the accuser. He will come and say, you're ungodly, you're ungodly, you've done this, you've done that, you screwed up here, you've had these thoughts. And to that you say, yes, yes, I am ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. You take it up with him. If you haven't been studying your Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, I would encourage you to, because you have to understand that to fully understand and appreciate Jesus. The Old Testament sin sacrifice, when you sin, you had to give a blood offering without shedding of blood. There is no remission. There is no forgiveness. And you would bring this lamb without blemish to the priest, and the priest would examine it. And he wouldn't look at how bad the sin was. He wouldn't look at the sinner. He examined the sin offering, the blood sacrifice for sin. Well, here's the thing, friend. Jesus is our all in all. He is our everything. He is the great high priest. It's a whole other teaching for another time. He is our great high priest and he is also our sin sacrifice. What does John say when he sees Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because he understood. He was very familiar with that system. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The gift of your cleansing, of your right standing before God, of your adoption. The key that opens the door, the blood that washes you clean, is Jesus. He is both your high priest and your sin sacrifice. He is all in all. Without him was not anything made that was made. He is everything. He ought to be everything to you and me, and he is our sin sacrifice. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So reign in life. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. That's the good news. So if you are a sinner, if you have screwed up, I'm talking to you. Now if you're righteous and don't need a savior, I'm not going to try and preach to you because I'm not going to do what Jesus didn't do. Jesus himself said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Have you sinned? Do you need a savior? Amen, brother. So do I. And we have it. It's already been given. It is finished. Jesus is our sacrifice for sin. Our atonement lies in Christ. Our salvation lies in Christ. His very name means salvation. Continuing on in Romans, let me read another passage talking about reigning and ruling. You'll find this if you're going to go back and read it yourself in Romans 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba. Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, I think to fully appreciate that, we should understand what an heir is. An heir is somebody that inherits. And it's not based on their works. There's no conditions. It's based on who the father is. If the father is king, the son inherits based on who the father is, not on who the son is. Children get what the parents have. They inherit that. That's an heir. Again, it's a gift. It's not earned. Just by their very being children, they are heirs. Think about that and let that sink in. 
Think about that in the context we just read. Whatever your circumstances are have been on this earth. If you are like me, if we are children of God, children of God, heirs and joint heirs with Christ, we've been grafted and we have been adopted so we can cry, Abba. Abba is like Daddy, Father. We have an inheritance. And in the whole earth, nothing compares to the beauty and the riches of our inheritance. Heaven. I don't know what heaven looks like. I don't know that I could imagine its beauty, its magnitude. But I know it's my inheritance. And I receive that gift because of who my Father is. Because I have been washed clean and atoned for by the blood of Christ. I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. I have more than I could ever imagine. That's good news. It's already been paid for. It's already yours. You are an heir. Again, an heir. But when he's a child, he doesn't actually hold it in his hand yet. All that the father has belongs to him. Legally binding. He is an heir. He will inherit. That adoption certificate. Accepting it. The blood of Christ. That gets you an inheritance incorruptible that places you far above. We read even in that passage, you'll have trials, you'll have tribulations. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Yeah, they exist, but you should be so far over them as an heir of God and a joint heir of Christ. You should be ruling over your fear, over sin, Sin is lying at the door and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Rule, reign. As we read in Genesis, God created man to have dominion, to be in control. You weren't called to live like some little rodent scurrying around. I'm very humbled that we have listeners from all over. Something I do and have done quite a bit of is hunting out west, the western, southwestern United States. We have these things called prairie dogs. They're, they pop up out of their hole and they look around. And one of the major predators of a prairie dog are hawks and owls. And when they see a shadow pass over, they freak out. They get afraid and they dive under the ground and hide. You're not a rodent. You're not a prairie dog. Stand up and be a man. Hold your head high and don't be afraid. Now, it's always good to bow down and humble yourself before God. Submit to God. Serve God. As far as life, as far as sin, as far as temptation, as far as fear and anxiety and worry, stand up like a man and have dominion over it and rule over it. You were called to have dominion, to reign in life. So reign. Receive the abundance of grace. Receive about being a father and saving up and having something great to give to your child they don't believe that you could ever have that much and they don't believe that they're going to get it that would be rather disrespectful we are children of god god has so much in store for us believe it receive it and reign in life receive that abundance of grace and reign in life we are and i say we if you are this grafted in washed clean by the blood of christ You are a child of God. We are holy. Holy means set apart and different. We are called to fear and serve God, and that is it. A perfect, loving master who always knows what's best for us. And that's the only thing you'll see in the Bible you're supposed to fear. Healthy reverence for the creator and maker of the universe. But the whole rest of the world is afraid of so many other things. Diseases and pandemics and economic collapse and not life more than food do not worry about what you'll put on what you'll wear what you'll eat seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you i know sometimes here on this earth we take our eye off the prize martha martha you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. 
That's what Jesus tells Martha when she is so distracted about other seemingly small and petty things. She's not paying attention to Christ. Only one thing is needed. About whatever problem you have. Strike that. Think about a prince. Whatever problem he has. He goes to the father, to the king. That's what it means to be an heir. No matter what kind of person the prince is. If his father is king, he is heir to the kingdom. That's how that works. It's a gift. It's received, not earned. Likewise, you, an heir of God. He has a problem, he goes to the king. If we have a problem, we go to the king. Not the king of some nation state. We go to the king of the universe. The king of king and lord of lords. Our advocate. Our king, our high priest, our sin sacrifice. Jesus Christ is all in all. He is your advocate. He is your atoning sacrifice. He is your king. Run to him, his arms are open wide. Whatever you're dealing with. Go to the king. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Go to God. Receive that abundance of grace, and reign in life. With that, brothers and sisters, family, reign in life. Have a blessed day.